Good evening, or I guess good afternoon or good morning. It really depends on where you are in the world right now. But welcome to the Writing Revolution, an overview of the Hockman Method. We do have a full house this evening, um, so I'm going to give folks a few minutes to log in and get settled. And so in the meantime, please feel free to put in the chat your location. It's always fun to see where people are zooming in from. So I say we'll give it about three or four minutes and then we'll get started. Wow, we've got people from all over the US so far. Alabama, oh my goodness, Ohio, Texas, it's coming in faster than I can actually read it. This is pretty fun. Canada. Malaysia. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. All right, we've got people from Georgia in the house, I have to say, yes, because I'm in Georgia. <clears throat> oh, this is going to be fun. This is awesome. Florida, Arizona. All the way from California, New Jersey. Was that Bangkok? Bangkok. Oh wow. my goodness. Wow. Virginia. Very fun. Georgia. give folks just another minute or two. I can tell it's still probably a little that people are still joining. So Australia. Couple folks from Texas. <clears throat> Malaysia. Indonesia. Wow. Wow. Massachusetts. Canada, Toronto. All right, well, I guess I'm gonna get started. That, that, was, that was really fun to watch where everybody's coming from. So welcome, welcome to our webinar series, Spotlight on Structured Literacy. My name is Nicole Vella, and I am serving as the president of the Reading League Georgia chapter. We are pleased to host this series on behalf of the boards of the Reading League Georgia and IDA Georgia. This marks our second year collaborating to provide webinars focused on structured literacy and the science of reading and writing. I wanna say a special thanks to Jen Birch, who is a board member for the IDA Georgia. She will support us this evening by monitoring the chat and facilitating the Q&A with Dr. Vroom and Dr. Zolio. I also wanna thank all the other Reading League Georgia and IDA Georgia board members who work to put these webinars together. We are only able to do this with their support. The Reading League Georgia and IDA Georgia are committed to providing information on evidence-based practices to educators and parents and advocates. In doing so, we hope that all students gain access to structured literacy instruction. In this four-part series, our speakers discuss how to most effectively instruct literacy based on the science of instruction 
and what content to include to ensure students become competent readers and writers. The first speaker in our series was Dr. Anita Archer, and she focused on joining the science of reading with the science of instruction. The second speaker was Dr. Sharon Vaughn. Dr. Vaughn talked about the science of reading comprehension. Tonight's speakers, Dr. Tony and Vroom and Dr. Zena Zolio, will provide information about the Hockman Method, an evidence-based method for teaching writing, including connecting content across subject areas to writing. Before we begin, thanks to those who submitted questions when you registered for the webinar. If you have other questions, please just drop them in the chat. As I already mentioned, the chat will be monitored and Dr. Zavroom and Zolio will address as many of your questions as possible during the Q&A. And now it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's speakers. Dr. Vroom and Dr. Zolio are the co-executive directors of the Writing Revolution. The Writing Revolution is a national nonprofit that trains educators and supports schools and districts in implementing the Hockman Method, an evidence-based method of writing instruction that transforms the way students write, learn, read, think, and express themselves. Dr. Vroom was previously a lead social studies teacher and school-wide writing coordinator at New Dwarf High School. Dr. Zolio was previously the assistant principal at New Dorp, where she co-led the effort to bring the Hockman Method to the school. Both Drs. Vroom and Zolio have been with the Writing Revolution since its founding in 2014. Today, the Writing Revolution trains thousands of teachers yearly and partners with schools and districts across the United States. Drs. Vroom and Zolio have developed content for the Writing Revolution, as well as textbooks and curriculum guides and presented at the Aspen Institute, South by Southwest, and the College Board Foundation, as well as many other venues on the topic of writing. Both Drs. Vroom and Zolio earned doctoral degrees in student literacy from St. John's University. So please welcome Drs. Vroom and Zolio. Thank you so much. Thank you for that lovely uh, introduction. So nice to meet you all and to have so many attend from around the world. Uh, we are very, very excited to give a little glimpse into the writing revolution, our work, and specifically the Hockman method uh, and the, the strategies and hope hoping that you will learn some strategies in this session that you can walk away with and implement immediately, uh, whether you're an educator doing this with students, a parent or a caregiver doing this uh, with your children. Uh, so we're very, very excited to get started. Uh, Dr. Zaleo, if you wanna say hello before we jump in. Yes, I'm equally excited to share a glimpse of this uh, method that really we've seen transform so many classrooms, including our, our, our own. And um, yeah, just very grateful for this opportunity and very humbled. So thank you. So welcome to our session on uh, the Writing Revolution and our overview of the Hockman Method. So we'll begin with just a little background about uh, who the Writing Revolution is and what we do. Uh, the Writing Revolution is a nonprofit organization that trains and supports educators in implementing the Hockman Method, which is an explicit set of evidence-based strategies for teaching expository writing. So we support educators in courses. We have partnerships with schools and districts where we work with teachers on the ground in incorporating this writing methodology into what they teach. Uh, and just to say up front that the writing revolution is not a curriculum. The writing revolution is a carefully sequenced set of strategies that are intended to be embedded in whatever content it is students are learning. And throughout the session uh, today, we'll show examples of how these strategies can be incorporated across subject areas. So we are here to talk about writing, and we wanted to begin with this quote because we feel like it encompasses why we all value writing as such an important skill. 
We use writing for so many different purposes. It's a versatile skill. Uh, it's a way we learn. It's a way we persuade others. We record, we express ourselves. We make meaning of events and situations. Uh, and writing is something that we know we're gonna use for a lot of different purposes. And in order to be successful in life, it's, some, it's a skill that we all need. So for us, being able to write well, clearly, coherently, should not be an option for our students, but it's a skill that all students should be equipped to be able to do. So again, we use writing for different purposes, but why we are here, the Writing Revolution, is to train educators in teaching expository writing, which is that writing that is used to explain or inform. And we know that starting at a young age, school-age children are expected to be able to do this to be successful in school. This goes straight from elementary through the secondary level, the college level, and beyond in the workplace. And regardless of path that a child takes in life, this ability to be able to communicate uh, clearly in an organized fashion is something that they will need to, in order to be successful. And we wanted to include here this recent survey that was done of employers uh, where they were surveyed on the attributes that they look at on a candidate's resume. And I know that many in our audience today are educators of very, very young children, but we are preparing them at some point in time, they're going to be applying for that job. And perhaps not surprisingly, that three quarters of employers say that they really look at those written communication skills on that candidate's resume. And we know that so often that ability to write is what may open the door or unfortunately what may close the door when a judgment is made that that writing is just not uh, clear and coherent. So uh, writing to explain and inform, very, very important. Uh, Unfortunately, it's an area that many, many of our students will struggle in starting at a young age and going straight through the secondary level. We see this on uh, national assessments that have been done in writing, but we also see this, any of us that are looking at student work and our different uh, walks in life, any of us that are looking at a child's writing will see some pretty common issues. So what we did was we selected a couple of student samples. These are samples from students in the schools where we work. These are baseline assessments that are taken before they learned uh, the Hockman method. And we chose these because they're pretty symbolic of what we see many students doing. So on the left-hand side, we have Leia Lim, a second grade student, so about maybe seven years old or so. And at the beginning of the school year, Leia Lim was asked to write a paragraph about the best part of her summer. And as you can see, Leia Lim writes, I got to stay at home, I got to watch TV, I got to play the Switch, I got to go on my mommy's iPad, I got to go to bed at 10.30 and 11.30, so Leyland is telling us, the reader, all the things that she got to do. Now we see that Leyland is asked to write a paragraph and it's really not reading like a paragraph at all. It doesn't have that structure of a beginning, a middle or an end. It's reading more like that list. It's lacking that coherence uh, for the reader. But if we zoom in very closely, we see that it's also at the single sentence level where Leyland needs some support. There are certainly some glows in her writing. We could look at her, her letters, we could look at, um, um, she has more or less the concept of a sentence, but she is quite repetitive. She relies on that sentence starter, and she's either really excited about all those things she got to do in the summer, or she becomes very reliant on that exclamation point. So she's lacking that sentence variety and complexity, as well as the concept of a paragraph. And that issue isn't just exclusive to young children. We see that in middle school and high school, that may carry on and some other issues as well. So we selected Danny, who's a ninth grade student, so about 14 years old at this time. And he was asked at the beginning of the year to write a paragraph about why we should study the past. This was in a social studies class. And we see in Danny's writing that there are some grammatical issues with his writing. He's quite repetitive in what he has to say. So even at the high school level, and Danny, this student in particular, is considered to be at grade level, general education student. But we see that it's both at the paragraph level and that single sentence level where Danny needs some support. So many of our students struggle when it comes to writing. Adults as well admit that it's one of the most challenging things we're ever asked to do. And the question is why? Why is it that writing is so challenging? And there are a whole host of reasons why, but let's just home in on some of the most important ones. First and foremost, there is that difference between spoken and written language. So case in point, here we're looking at one little snippet of a student uh, writing sample. 
And this sample here, so I once read a book called Diary of a Wimpy Kid. There's a character named Gregory. This is more of that spoken language structure. It sounds as if this student here is having a conversation with us. Or this other sample here, did you like summer break? I did, and I'm gonna tell you all about it. That's more of that conversational tone. And what we know is that there are some structures that are used in writing that we don't use when we speak. And when students aren't explicitly taught those structures, they don't just magically appear in their writing. What happens? The students end up falling back on what it is they already know, which is how to talk. And that's why their writing sounds that way. This is very different than this little piece that you see here where the student writes Ricky, a character in the banana leaf ball changes throughout the story. That's more of that written language structure. That sample there includes an appositive, which is one of the strategies that we'll talk about in this session. This child was explicitly taught that written language structure and you could just hear as well as see how these two samples sound very different. And as an aside, the two samples that you see on the screen here are of the same student before and after learning uh, the strategies and how it really can change the look in their writing. So again, that difference. Writing also requires this awareness of audience. When we're writing, we're communicating to a reader and many of our students lack that awareness or they make assumptions about what the reader may already know. And that will impact a lot of things in their writing. The amount of information that they include, their word choice will be affected by their sense of audience. So that's some one of those many, many things that students have to keep in mind when they write. Also, writing requires background knowledge. It's nearly impossible to write well about something that we don't understand, that we don't have a grasp of. And when students are lacking that background knowledge is going to impact the way that they communicate, whether that be world knowledge or even word knowledge is going to impact their writing. And last, but certainly not least, maybe most importantly, we cannot overlook those very very heavy cognitive demands that writing imposes specifically on our memory. So speaking about memory for a moment, we know that we have our long-term memory, which is seemingly limitless. It stores and organizes almost an infinite amount of information indefinitely, something that for the most part, we can more or less easily retrieve. If we think back to a childhood phone number or an address, that's something that we uh, could usually be able to pull because it's stored in that long-term memory. And we know that that's when learning really happens, when uh, knowledge, skills are, are stored in that long-term memory. Very different than short-term memory which is brief, something that just holds on to information for a very brief period of time, maybe 15 to 30 seconds. If I were to say a phone number to you, you'd probably be able to repeat that back to me. If I asked you about that phone number, maybe 30 minutes from now or an hour from now, it's, it's in and out of your memory. It's gone because that's short term. Anytime we are manipulating multiple uh, things at once. So multiple maybe skills or pieces of information, especially when we're thinking about maybe new information, now we're tapping into that working memory piece. Unlike long-term memory, working memory is not uh, limitless. It, it, it has a capacity, it has a limited capacity, and it can easily be overloaded, especially when information is new or a skill is new. And anything taking up that precious space in working memory is what's referred to as cognitive load. And writing, perhaps more than any other academic skill, imposes a very, very heavy cognitive load. And if you think about it, there are a lot of skills at play anytime we ask a child to write. So we'll just share a few of them. On the left-hand side here, we have in blue some of what we may consider the lower level skills when it comes to writing. Uh, and by lower level, we don't mean unimportant because if students do not know how to form those letters or spell their words or some of the rules of capitalization and punctuation, if their mind is think still really thinking about those things, it's gonna be very challenging for them to focus their attention on some of the higher level skills skills when it comes to writing, like that audience or meaning or what's the purpose behind the assignment. So many of these skills are coming into play at the same time. It's the reason why for our youngest students, we want them to have pretty relatively automatically uh, their letter formation down, their understanding of capitalization, punctuation, so that they could devote those limited cognitive resources to what's on the right-hand side. 
Now we can start writing strategies very young. Uh, we work with a lot of teachers starting at the kindergarten level in first grade, but what does that look like? Well, we teach the writing strategies, but with a very heavy emphasis on oral practice. What we know is that those oral language skills are really what's gonna prime the pump for later reading and writing success. So the strategies that we show you in the session can be practiced as early as kindergarten, but with a heavy emphasis on students practicing orally so that we don't overload that working memory. We always keep that in mind uh, when it comes to writing, which is such a challenging skill. It's also what Dr. Hockman kept in mind when she developed this methodology for teaching writing. So the writing revolution, the Hockman method is a carefully sequenced approach that begins at that single sentence level. Thinking of Leolin, thinking of Danny, that paragraph will only be as good as the sentences that make it up. The, se the sentence is the foundation of all good writing. So this is where we begin, but it builds from here. We start with a sentence, we move to a single paragraph, but very, very important, bearing in mind that cognitive burden of writing, we know how challenging it could be for students to write just a single paragraph. And one of the best ways to mitigate that is teaching them how to plan before they write. So we are gonna show and we'll share with you in this session how a single paragraph outline can be used to produce that paragraph. Similarly, when students are ready to move to writing a composition, they'll also learn how to make that plan first. Instead, they're going to use the multiple paragraph outline. And at this point, we have a very solid foundation laid for more sophisticated forms of writing, like writing argumentatively or writing a research paper. And embedded throughout the Hockman Method are some other important skills and strategies, teaching students how to make improvements to their work, how to revise, teaching how to take notes, teaching how to summarize. And the key thing here is teaching. We know that many of these things, whether it be note-taking or summarizing, are often assigned to students. They're from very, very young up through the high school level and beyond. Annotate, take notes on this, or write a summary of what you just read. And what's so important for us to recognize is that there's a very, very big difference between assigning a child to write and teaching them how. And what this method does is it rests on explicit instruction in these strategies to teach students how to do these very critical skills. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Zaleo. Um, okay, one second. Yeah. Sorry, someone's asking for um, subtitles. Uh. Okay. Okay. And the last piece of this, of so, uh, turning it over to Dr. Zaleo to talk about the, the principles underlying this method is for us, even though our name is the writing revolution, we always say that name of, is a bit of a misnomer because this is not just about writing. We see these three areas of writing, reading, and thinking as being inseparable. And in many respects, writing can be used to boost or elevate those other two areas. And you'll see that as we go through some examples uh, of the strategies. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Vroom. So the Hoffman method rests on six principles and it's really important that, uh, or, or we want to actually take some time to briefly discuss each principle because it's critically important to understand uh, the, the foundations of how this, you know, how this method works. And so we'll go through each one, or I'll go through each one sort of briefly, but first and foremost, very, very important, uh, principle one, students need explicit instruction in writing beginning in the early elementary grades, right? So very few students become good writers uh, on their own. We know that um, they just won't really pick up a writing through reading, you can be an avid reader, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you will be a good writer. Writing is uh, expressive, reading is receptive, and though they are reciprocal skills, they both need very explicit uh, instruction. So again, you know, by students just reading, that doesn't necessarily mean that that will transfer into helping them become good writers. What we um, do stress at the writing revolution is we think a lot about, or we uh, tell teachers sort of think about uh, the 
you know, training a writer very much like you would train a athlete or a musician uh, and think about what interventions would they need to be successful. So they very much rely on the, tri the tried and true practice of observing and doing. And that's uh, what we believe should also be taken into consideration when teaching writing, that uh, students or uh, novice or struggling writers in particular, they really do benefit from um, observing and uh, and doing. So just like in a, an athlete is, you know, learning finger placement before they're actually, you know, performing a solo on stage, or the basketball player is learning to dribble first before they're doing or expected to take the winning layup. Uh, it's really important that we're building those foundational skills. And one way to really do that is through this explicit uh, instruction through deliberate practice through modeling so that students actually get a chance to observe and watch the teacher and uh, in these images these are all uh, teachers from our partner schools that are modeling the strategies for their students so they could actually see them and get a mental image of what the strategy looks like and they get to hear their teachers thought process as they work through the strategy um, and then obviously they uh, there's times for students to you know again um, there's times Time for co-construction where the students are uh, or the teachers are listening multiple responses from students and then the teacher is capturing those and actually modeling and putting them on the board so students can see those responses so it's really important uh, to use or um, use explicit instruction when teaching uh, the TWR strategies it's critically important as Dr. Vroom mentioned, sentences are the building blocks of all good writing. Therefore, they are very much um, the bedrock of this method. And so we uh, teach strategies that very much focus on students being, being able to extend their responses to keep the reader in mind when they're writing. So for example, one of we're, we're not going to do it in the interest of time today, but one of the sentence strategies that we teach is sentence expansion, where students are taking that kernel sentence, very small, bare bones, declarative sentence, like it sank, and then they're answering those question words, you know, what, when, where, why, and giving more information. And then they're taking that and then they're expanding that original kernel sentence to something like on April 14th, 1912, the Titanic sank in the North Atlantic because it hit an iceberg. So again, they're taking something that's very bare bones, which uh, obviously Dr. Vroom and I, in our experience, even at the high school level, would see sentences like that in student writing. And so by teaching the sentence expansion activity, again, students are thinking about the content they're learning and being able to expand and give more information to a reader and write a much more linguistically complex sentence. Uh, same thing here, we teach a positives and we're going to actually get tonight to share that strategy with you. But again, it's another sentence level strategy that's really very powerful from, for helping students move away from those oral language structures in their writing to be able to present themselves more like writers because the positives are, are a really popular you know, written language structure. What's important to note is that um, we know, you know, for decades, in, at least in the United States, writing has sort of been taught in sort of isolation at times, like, you know, you may see a writing center down the hall, um, where writing was sort of divorced uh, from content that students are learning. And so that's something that we are really trying to sort of say, look, that's really hasn't been working. Um, writing works best or these strategies work best when they are very much embedded in the content of the curriculum and very much embedded in what students are learning about. So it's not something that's separate and apart, but it's actually, again, part of um, what they're learning. And it's a powerful teaching tool. It's a powerful way for students to retain and uh, retain content knowledge and cement it. So uh, in this method, we very much stress the fact that the strategies like Because Button So, which you'll also get to see tonight, Dr. Vroom will show you in action, but this strategy can be used across multiple content areas. So you can see that strategy like you see here in ELA, uh, around the New Deal and social studies, around rainforests and science, and around error analysis and math. And so what's been so amazing for Dr. Vroom and I, 
um, is going into school buildings and seeing the silos of teaching writing sort of broken um, or have sort of vanished a bit because what's happening, our students are going class to class and they're hearing a common cohesive message and they're using the same strategies uh, class to class across subject areas and grade levels. So you really do get this um, very powerful, consistent approach in a building. And it's it's really exciting when you see it because it really can make a huge difference uh, for students. Now, something else to note, the content of the curriculum drives the rigor of the writing activity. So sometimes we're asked, well, when students go from, you know, first grade to ninth grade, you know, are the strategies different? And the answer is no. The strategies of the method remain the same. It is the content that will drive the rigor. So, for example, case in point, if I'm in third grade and uh, we're reading Chicks and Salsa, the book Chicks and Salsa, I would be given this subordinating conjunction activity after the ducks were inspired by the chickens. And so now the students have to, you know, finish that response or finish that activity by um, responding to that. But then um, they can be doing that same exact subordinating conjunction activity in 10th grade around um, the French Revolution. So they're learning about Napoleon. And you see here after Napoleon advocated the French throne, and then you can see uh, what the students are writing. The French gov government called for the establishment of a constitutional monarchy. A little different than Chicks and Salsa. Now, what changed was the content, the text that the students are reading, the material, right? That is what's changed. The strategy basically is, is very similar. So it is that content that will drive the rigor um, throughout the grades. What's also very important uh, about this method is that this is not about sort of teaching grammar in isolation. Sometimes um, people say to us, oh, yay, someone's going sort of back to basics. That's how I learned. You know, I learned through a lot of sentence diagramming um, or identifying uh, parts of speech. And we'll say, no, that's really not what this is about. This is very much about learning or teaching grammar through the context of student writing. So this is really not about sort of having students, especially novice or struggling writers, you know, breaking down sentences into their component parts or labeling parts of speech or diagramming, because that's just going to add a lot of times to confusion or take up valuable cognitive real estate. Um, because it doesn't really carry over to their writing or transfer. So doing these very you know, isolated activities where we're doing a lot of identifying, that really hasn't worked. And the research sort of supports that, that really teaching grammar in isolation does not um, help students learn to compose. But what does work is really, again, teaching it through the context of student writing and showing them strategies where they will then practice those strategies and write them and learn to write using them. So for example, we'll bring back the appositive again. Uh, we'll teach students what an appositive is and we will show them how to use it in their writing so that again, students are practicing that skill within their own writing and uh, it will, and they'll learn, you know, about commas and they'll under, they'll will organically sort of teach the grammar, but it is through the strategy. We're not having isolated lessons on comma splices or, you know, or just showing them, you know, to identify subjects and predicates. We're teaching it through the strategy, which I think teachers really appreciate. It's not again done uh, in isolation. And then the last principle that's really, really important, and I think sometimes is uh, it's underestimated how important it really is, and that is that the two most important phases of the writing process is you know, planning or planning and revising. So as Dr. Vroom mentioned before, we know that few activities are as cognitively demanding as writing, and especially um, writing at length. So it's really important that students plan to mitigate some of that cognitive load before they write. And in this method, we'll teach students to use an outline, a single paragraph outline before going to write a paragraph. So the days of just telling students, hey, just write, like that needs to sort of end. We really need to teach students how to plan their ideas first, because we know that will alleviate a lot of that cognitive burden and get them to really get their ideas down and organize them in a logical, uh, sequential way, and then take that plan and then show them how that plan can lead to their actual paragraph. Uh, and that's really an important piece of this. Also, revising. 
And um, in this method, we do make the distinction between editing and revising. We know editing a lot of times focuses heavily on mechanics, fixing spelling and punctuation. And that's important, but we really want to stress to students how they can improve the substance of their writing. And that's where revision comes in. And it's um, a little more rigorous in the sense that students will look at their work like Susie did, where she's writing this paragraph about Mansa Musa, and her teacher is giving her feedback, but that feedback to revise her work is grounded in the sentence level strategies that she's learned in the method. So if you notice, the teacher is not saying things like I did in the past, I put myself out there, you know, make it better, Susie. Um, if Susie knew how to make it better, she would have make it, she would have made it better in the first place. It's really about um, adding a positive, you know, um, combine your sentences, expand your sentences. And this, these sentence strategies become very much synonymous with the feedback that teachers are giving students. So you have this common language now between the teacher and the student about how to improve. And um, it really, again, makes feedback so powerful. It almost, again, makes feedback more like feed forward because the students know exactly what they can do to improve it. So you see with Susie, again, case in point, she was asked or her teacher said, add in a positive. And because Susie had practiced that at the sentence level, she knew exactly what to do. And so she took that sentence, Mansa Musa had a great impact on the Mali empire. And then changed it or improved it by saying Mansa Musa, an educated sultan, had a great impact impact on the Mali empire. So you can see here, um, obviously, the difference. But it's those sentence strategies that Susie is relying on to improve the substance of her writing. OK, so I now turn it back over to Dr. Vroom to actually get into some of the sentence strategies. And um, Dr. Vroom, I pass it to you. Thank you. This, this is our favorite part is sharing some of the, the strategies again that you could go and use tomorrow. Uh, you could use these strategies orally with with children as well. So real excited just to jump in. Uh, we have a whole uh, suite of sentence level strategies. Here you see them on the screen. Uh, they're explained in the Writing Revolution book, uh, co-authored by Dr. Hoffman and Natalie Wexler. And these strategies will build in complexity. It starts with the most basic of what, what is a sentence? How is that different from something that is not a sentence, a fragment? And then it builds towards strategies that help students add information to their sentences, build sentence complexity, so on and so forth. Uh, we wish we had the time to go through all of these with you in this session, uh, but since we don't, we're going to just select a couple. We'll begin with Because But So, which is a fan favorite, pretty well-known strategy, and we'll look at why that is. Because But So, as we know, are conjunctions, and there are many, many different conjunctions. Uh, however, we focus on these three in this strategy because of what these uh, conjunctions in particular will do because we know is used to tell why, give an explanation, but showing a contrast or a change of direction. And so, as we know, is used for so many, so I just did it, so many different ways. Uh, but in this activity, we're using so to indicate cause and effect. Okay. So there, I did it again. Why do we teach because but so? Well, for a lot of reasons. And for every strategy that we share with you, we want to share the why behind it. We think it's re really important that educators, caregivers be mindful of what this why is. Uh, and also in our schools, our teachers in a very student-friendly way find a way to share this with them as well. So they understand the why behind it. So here's our why behind because but so. By using these conjunctions, it's going to help students create either compound or complex sentences and really becomes a way for students to extend their response, which really so much of this method is grounded in language development. And what we want our students to extend those responses, both in writing and orally. As you'll see through the activity, it really can be used to boost students' analytical thinking and their reading comprehension. It's a fantastic opportunity to see if students can utilize new vocabulary words by embedding it in the strategy. And all of the activities serve as really great comprehension checks. So there are a lot of benefits to doing because, but, and so. One additional benefit, something I know that uh, Dr. Zaleo and I experienced when we were doing this in the classroom, is really the way it could elevate the way that we question our students and check their understanding. So here's a really quick example of this. Uh, imagine uh, a class is learning about Jackie Robinson, very important baseball player, but not only an important baseball player, but also very critical in the civil rights movement in the United States. 
Uh, and they're reading a text, a very popular text uh, here is called Promises to Keep. And students might be asked a comprehension question like this. Why was Jackie Robinson a popular baseball player? I ask things like this all the time, that why question. And often when I would ask a question like this, I would get that one or two word response. More times than not, they were just pretty much regurgitating back the facts that I shared in class. Didn't really realize that this type of a question was assessing more of that memorization piece. Uh, I didn't realize that until I tried something different. Instead of just asking why was Jackie Robinson a popular baseball player, giving students a sentence stem, Jackie Robinson was a popular baseball player because Jackie Robinson was a baseball, uh, popular baseball player, but, and then so. So now they're thinking of that same concept three different ways using each conjunction in turn. Why was Jackie Robinson a popular baseball player? Well, I'm still gonna get at that why. He led the league in hitting and stolen bases. There are many other reasons why students can provide, but we're not just gonna stop there. We're gonna really push their thinking, not just think of a reason, but also can you think of something, uh, a change of directions, a contrast to this. So popular, right? We, we think of that as something good, that's a positive, but it, was there another side to that? Yes, but he still faced discrimination. And now we really wanna push their thinking to think of the effect. And that's what so, that little baby conjunction of so is going to do to push their thinking towards the effect of that. So what? So fans traveled long distances to watch him play. And what this strategy does is it assesses that, still assesses that comprehension, but teaches the writing at the same time. This is that embedded instruction. We're not just having students memorize what is a conjunction, what does it do, but really do they know how to use it uh, in their own writing and use it around what they're learning. So this really can elevate their analytical thinking about the content. And any place where there is content is an opportunity for students to do a because but so could be in English class, could be in social studies. So popular topic here in the States, learning about the uh, federal program, the New Deal, instead of just asking why was the New Deal effective or was the New Deal effective, giving that STEM. The New Deal was effective because, but, and so. So in English, in social studies, in math, which is one of the most amazing ways for students to demonstrate their ma mathematical thinking is by doing a because but so. They get this problem on the top, they really have to dissect what happened in that problem, and then they receive this. Jackie's answer was incorrect because, Jackie's answer was incorrect, but was there anything that she did that, that was correct? Jackie's answer was incorrect, so what's the impact of that? So her substitution did not work. So as Dr. Zaleo mentioned, this is an opportunity that students can go from one subject to the next and see the same strategy and really be able to engage with it more around the content. Uh, so I see the question, uh, do we teach because but so used together in their writing versus just in isolation? So we're teaching these three conjunctions. Uh, they are, if we just go back one slide, I just do want to point out that the students are creating three separate sentences. So it's not one long sentence using because, but, and so, but we're teaching the three, these three conjunctions at a time. However, if you're starting this with very young children, if you're starting this say in kindergarten or in first grade, we would introduce one of these conjunctions at a time. And even though they're learning this as a writing strategy, the product that they create can look very different depending on where students are. So they can be practicing this orally where the, the teacher might be saying the sentence stem and the students are completing it. And that could go straight through high school. That's not just something for young students, all students benefit from practicing these strategies orally. For our young students, depending on where they are, they may practice this on their own, maybe on a worksheet. Some students can practice this in groups, like you see in this picture on the left-hand side, the group is working together to complete that because but so as a team. And for the students on the right-hand side, they're still engaging in the strategy, but rather than completing the sentence, the teacher was able to scaffold the activity to meet these students where they were at. So they're not creating the ending, but they were matching these sentence strips with the conjunction so they could still engage in the activity, learn how the conjunction works in the sentence, be able to determine which is the reason, which is that contrast or that U-turn, which some will describe it as the U-turn, uh, which is the effect. Uh, so e just the point here is that they're, they are learning writing, but the product might look a little different depending on their age. 
Uh, but for older students, uh, especially at the secondary level, we can't underestimate these two little conjunctions. We might look at these and say, well, but and so there's there's such simple little conjunctions. Don't our students already know these words? Don't they already use them? They may already know these words, but they're not necessarily using them the way that we would like for them to in their writing. What do we see time and time again? These, again, are real student samples, things like this. Using so at the beginning of the sentence, almost like a, a filler word. So the whole point, or so I once read a book, very, very conversational, or on the bottom, putting but at the beginning of the sentence and, and writing probably a fragment after that. But then one day, so we're going to teach the students how to use these conjunctions as intended in their writing, because what we do know is when they get these concepts, it lays the foundation for other language we want our students to be able to use in their writing. So, but eventually will become like, although, or even though, or on the other hand. So once students get that concept of cause and effect with that little conjunction of so, they can begin using language like therefore, as a result, or consequently. But we build this very carefully, and we cannot make assumptions, especially for our oldest students. We're coming to you as former high school level educators up through advanced placement classes. We, we can assume what students are already able to do in their writing, and this helps scaffold them up toward what we want them to be able to do. Another fan favorite sentence level strategy, we keep mentioning the appositive, so we had to go through this one with you tonight. We love the appositive, students love the appositive. Uh, so what is it? <laughs> Likely you encounter them all the time and probably use them in your own writing. We know that the appositive is a noun, a noun phrase, or a noun clause placed next to another noun to rename it or explain it more fully. Keyword here is noun, lots of nouns going on. So what is that? If we look at this uh, sample sentence here about the writing revolution, we're coming to you as the writing revolution. Here's a basic sentence. The writing revolution envisions a day when all students acquire well-developed writing skills. That is true. If we wanted to give maybe a little more information about the writing revolution, we could add something to that sentence. We could say a nonprofit organization. That would give the reader a little bit more information. And that's what the appositive does. It renames that noun that's in front of it or describes it more fully. And here are just some more examples of sentences with the appositive. Frederick Douglass, a passionate abolitionist. Esperanza, the narrator of the house on Mango Street. So the appositive is what you see in red. And when we're reading, this is typically how we're going to see it most frequently, where you have the, the subject of the sentence followed by that a positive. But a positives can appear in multiple places in the sentence. They could appear at the end, as you see in the third example for the rainforest. They could appear all the way up front at the beginning of the sentence. No matter where it is in the sentence, you see that that a positive isn't necessary to the sentence. Grammatically, we could pull it out and that sentence can still stand but it helps give that reader more information. And something very important to note about the Hockman method is that it is a reader-centered approach. And we always want our students thinking of that reader when they write and what information would be helpful for them to learn. So why we teach a positives for so many different reasons, that a positive is a written language structure. We showed that quick example up front with the, the Ricky, a character in a banana leaf ball, that is not something that we typically use when we speak. Rarely are you going to find someone that speaks using a positive. So it's just not that type of a construct in spoken language. But it's something that we encounter in written text all of the time. Here's one quick example. This is an article from the New York Times. And just in this one article, there were so many places where the writer used the positives. We highlighted them for you in yellow. And when our students are reading, what we do know is that they do encounter these quite a bit. If your students have uh, any sort of issue with reading, especially longer sentences that are more dense, that have embedded clauses, I'll give one example here. If we look at the uh, last one, Matthias Maurer, a German astronaut. Some students might not realize that a German astronaut is describing what's in front of it. They might think it's an additional person. They think of commas as being something in a list. So when students learn how to write using these appositives, it's going to help them better understand these types of sentences when they read. So this is in service of reading comprehension. 
So that written language structure will certainly help change the look of their writing, will help them put extra information in their sentences without making them too clunky, uh, will help them vary up that sentence structure. Remember Layla in at the beginning, every sentence following that same structure, I got to do this, I got to do that. Now we're gonna help build that sentence variety, build that complexity, lots of benefits here. And even though we're talking about single sentences, we are laying the foundation for writing a paragraph or later an essay. What's one of the hardest things uh, students are asked to do or a place where they struggle the most is when they're writing that paragraph writing that first sentence, that topic sentence. They don't know how to start. You see it all the time in their writing. They'll write things like, in this paragraph, I'm going to tell you, or this paragraph is going to be about, or they just skip that and they jump right to their first detail. We're gonna give them tools to help them get started. And it really does help alleviate that cognitive load. Another way we could alleviate that cognitive load is by not just showing the positive up on the board and say, here's an positive. Look at all the places where writers use them. Now you start using them in your writing. We can't just assume that students will just, they'll magically appear in what they write, even when they read them a lot. We're going to really sequence the way that we teach this. First, we want to see if they could just identify it in a sentence. And then we're going to see, we're going to build up. Could they match in a positive to its subject? Uh, as you see in some of these images here where this really can be quite an engaging activity. It's not just, I'm gonna sit quietly in my notebook and write in a positive or do a worksheet. It really becomes an integral part of the lesson. In, in some of these images, students are matched, they're getting up, they're, they're working in pairs to match the positive together. Uh, it's a great opportunity for brainstorming. So if we look at this next activity here, going back to Jackie Robinson, uh, if students were going to say brainstorm about him, they could brainstorm not just adjectives to describe Jackie Robinson, but let's brainstorm some positives about Jackie Robinson. And what a beautiful opportunity to build vocabulary all different describing words. Uh, Jackie Robinson, a courageous athlete, a civil rights advocate. So there are a lot of scaffolds that can happen within any strategy. And we would love to share uh, one of those with you now. Uh, we do have a video, I'm looking at our time. Dr. Zaleo, do you think we have enough time to yeah. this yeah. one? Okay, so we're gonna show this video just so you could get a glimpse of what this can look and sound like in a classroom, a third grade class, doing a positive activity around the text because of Winn-Dixie. All right, now we're gonna do the same thing with the book that we're studying right now, The Class of Winn-Dixie. Do y'all like that book? Yeah. Okay, so now we're gonna recap what happened in chapter two. So what happened in chapter two? This is when Opal brings Winn-Dixie Win home. home to who? Her dad. Her her or her dad. So she's going to bring him. So we're going to react to chapter two from Because of Win Dixie by choosing an a positive to add to the sentence. You're going to write your answer on your two. So flip it over. And you have the same sentences that I have up here, you have right in front of you. Can you reach it? So Israel says, Opal, the preacher's daughter, has a complicated relationship with her father. Does that make sense? Is she yeah. the preacher's daughter? Okay, what's another one we can say about Opal, um, Milan? A sweet young girl. Is Opal a sweet young girl? Yeah. Why do we think she's sweet? What did she do? Because she, she, she helped Winn Dixie, Dixie to not she, go to the pound. She helped Winn Dixie not go to the pound and she cleaned them up. What else could we say, Janiah? Opal, a good little girl. Okay, good job. A good little girl. The next one, um, the preacher. Who did I say could come up for the preacher? Come on, um, Emily. Who's the you want me to write it? Okay. Good job. All right, so Emily says, 
the preacher, Uncle Dad, does not like to share his feelings with, with others. Is that a good or positive? Yeah. She didn't use A and or D, but is it still in the positive? Yeah. Yes. So let's see if it makes sense without that. Uncle Dad does not like to share his feelings with others. Does that sentence make sense? Yeah. Yes. Good job. Does somebody else have something different for the preacher? I think everybody just about has Uncle's Dad. What did you put, Milan? A hard worker. Girl, yes, he is a hard worker. Let's give it up for Milan. Good job. So Milan said, I'm going to put that on the board, too. She said, A hard. How do we know he's a hard worker? Because he stays in preacher. his shell all the time. He stays in his shell, and he's a preacher. Preachers work hard, huh? Yes. yes they do. So as you can see, when these activities are embedded in the content students are learning, there are opportunities for teachers to check comprehension, build that vocabulary. In this example, go back to the text. How do you know he's a hard worker? What does he do? Uh, so lots of benefits of using writing as also a learning tool. Uh, so we have for you a very uh, brief little try it. Uh, we would love to get to know those of you in the audience today. We would love in the chat if you just wanted to pop in a little sentence about yourself containing in a positive. So we have an example here uh, about yours truly. Uh, so <laughs> Dina, Tony, that's us lifelong New Yorkers, if our accents don't give it away, uh, are excited to be presenting an overview of the writing revolution. We would love to learn about you. Even if you just want to drop in a positive in the chat about you, we would love to hear it. Uh, and there are many things that might look like a positive just to get you started. If you begin it with a and or the, chances are it's going to be in a positive. So I'm going to give you an opportunity if the chat is open. Oh, here we go. Susan Lay, an avid reader, loves to teach their grade. Beautiful. So what a great way to learn two uh, things about someone. A tired teacher, yeah. Yep. Beautiful. Lifelong learner. Reading specials from Alabama. An active grandma. That's awesome. Angela, an Italian native speaker, loves God. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Joanne. <laughs> New Yorker. Wow. I think you could see through this one activity how engaging this could be for students too to start to use in their writing. And we did see the question, when do students move on to say maybe filling in in a positive versus using it in their authentic writing? So we're gonna teach them what it is first. As you're gonna see when we get, especially to the paragraphs and revision, these are going to be the strategies that they're going to tap into when they're writing out those sentences. Uh, they'll start to apply it to their independent work. But first they have to learn what that a positive is and how it's used in the sentence. These Thank are you. wonderful. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Big pattern here. Everyone is very exhausted. <laughs> it's, uh, this must be a universal thing happening across the world. Everyone's just working very hard and very tired, but. Might be the middle of the night where some, some wow. of these folks are coming from. Wonderful. So much. I'm going to keep reading the chat as I turn it back to Dr. Zaleo. Yeah. Yes, these are awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, so as um, Dr. Vroom mentioned, when the students are learning these strategies, you'll see that they do eventually start to appear in their own writing. You can see here um, that the topic sentence sort of changes. If you look at this student in September 2019 in grade seven, you'll see that this student was asked to write about you know, uh, a topic where they sort of wrote about or a character and they wrote, wrote about a, a very popular in the United States TV character um, from the show, The Office. And, um, you know, you look at the sentence and it's not even a sentence, it's a fragment, how Jim Halper changed right truth throughout the years. And then you see that same student and you fast forward to September, 2020, and you see after the students have learned these strategies, how that sort of changes. And the student now when writing a character, one writes about a character from a, a book, um, but also look at the topic sentence, right? You're now seeing Ha, a Vietnamese refugee, uh, has faced many hardships when evacuating Vietnam. So you can see how these strategies will sort of change the face of uh, your students' writing, um, you know, 
pretty quickly once they start to be exposed and learn them. And that's what's really exciting um, for us. What's also exciting is teaching students how to outline. So we mentioned this before, and yes, the sentence work is very important. And if you look at Leyland's work and Danny's work that we showed you at the beginning of the session, uh, it is at, yes, they need work at the sentence level, but it is definitely at the paragraph level that they also need work in. And um, what we will again say to, um, you know, these students is that you just can't write a paragraph. You really do need to plan before you write. Um, but not all plans are created equally. And so we have found that the SPO has been tremendous in helping students plan because it is a linear outline and it very much mimics the way that uh, students write or we write paragraphs. So if you look at this outline, it has, it's a roadmap for a paragraph. It has a place for students to write a topic sentence. Uh, there are solid lines there, and that's intentional because that's where they'll write a complete sentence. There are dotted lines where they'll write some keywords and phrases, so they're taught note-taking. Um, they're not writing out complete sentences there. They're really trying to get very succinct and be very salient, and they're writing different details, so they're not trying to be repetitive. Um, and then here you have a place for a concluding sentence. And again, they'll have that place with a solid line for a complete sentence. So you can see how this transfers that students, again, if we go back to Jackie Robinson, they have been learning a positive. So it's not going to be a heavy lift to write a topic sentence using an appositive. That's not the only way they can write one, but that is uh, an option now for students. So they'll write something like Jackie Robinson, an African-American baseball player, was a trailblazer. And then you're noticing their note-taking where they're really honing in on the most important facts and details that support that topic sentence, and then a concluding sentence. And they can spend a lot of time and should spend a lot of time, in fact, on just drafting the outline because there's a lot of benefit to that process where they're really spending ample time organizing their ideas in a sequential way. Um, but at some point, they'll be able to take that outline and then convert it to a paragraph. And that's when you'll start to see all of that sentence level work start to come to fruition. Well, they'll take down those notes and they could actually then, you know, create their sentences. So you see again how um, important that outline work is, uh, why we're teaching it. One, because it's that structure. The students really do need, for many of them, they need that roadmap. And so it really does provide this beginning and middle of an end um, for them to figure out their paragraph work. It helps them eliminate repetition. It helps them really adhere to the topic because a lot of times students tend to think that quantity equates to quality. And we know that's not always the case. And so they'll sort of start, you know, uh, going on and on and on, or, or they'll easily stray off topic. Um, so this really helps them adhere to it. It helps them uh, distinguish between what's essential and what's not essential, what, what details should be included that supports the topic sentence. Um, it really gives them this guide to placing their ideas in a logical order. Uh, really facilitates analytical thinking because they really have to think while they're drafting this outline about the content they're learning. Uh, it's easier to revise an outline than for them to go into a paragraph and revise. And again, uh, a very you know, good point of that is looking at one of our students from our partner school. When we saw this, we, we said, oh, there it is. There's the research and practice because what the student actually did in writing this SPO is realize that one of their um, details was in the wrong place. And so made, drew themselves or drew an arrow to switch those details. So this is a place where they can start to, again, make some revisions and revise. And it's much easier for them to do it here at the outline phase than before they actually start getting into their drafting a paragraph. Um, it's easy to revise and it's really easy to replicate. I think that's really important to note so that at some point, if students are just not given that template, but we have students that are given the, you know, piece of scratch paper, and they can very much uh, draft from, you know, long term memory, because it becomes a stored learning plan or a stored plan for them, they can um, draw it on, you know, um, uh, you know, draw upon it on demand and to cre and create that outline. So that's really exciting to see. And then obviously it's modulating that cognitive load because that outline really is helping to mitigate some of that cognitive burden. 
So what we want to show you, we have another video in action, and this one we're so excited to show you because this is uh, this is hot off the press. I was in one of our partner schools, uh, our partner districts is in Monroe, Louisiana, and uh, this is an elementary school there, Cypress Point. The teacher is Miss uh, Guillory, and this is one of the best lessons I have seen maybe ever, um, because it is to a first grade class and they're actually drafting and brainstorming around um, an SPO. So we wanted to show you this and then uh, we'll just, you know, highlight and speak about what really stands out about this lesson. But anyway, without further ado, this is Ms. Guillory and they're doing the, the SPO and brainstorming around something that they know a lot about, but I won't give it away. I'll let the video give it away or share it. So today, we're going to write on something that you all know about. We're going to write about our class pet. We're going to write about our class pet. So at the top of our brainstorm, we have to write class pet so that we know what we're writing about. Class pet because that's our topic. Now, when I'm brainstorming, I have to decide who am I brainstorming for? Who is going to be my audience? I want y'all to think about describing Rosie for your parents that have not seen Rosie. So we're gonna describe her so that your parents will know what Rosie is, what she looks like, without even seeing her. So are we ready to brainstorm? Yeah. Okay. Raise your hand if you can think about another detail we should tell our parents about Rosie. Tyron? Furry. 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 Excellent. Furry. Manye? She eats sunflower seeds. Think about where does Rosie live? Where does she live, Jamari? At my house. Think about what does Rosie live in? Zalia? In a cage. In a cage. In our classroom. In our classroom. That is a lot of brainstorming. But what is the next step? of our writing. Next step, Kayla, SPO. Why should we do a single paragraph outline, an SPO? Why should we do that? Paris? It helps us when we go to do our sentences. And it helps us do what with our information, say? It helps us organize our information. It helps us plan what we're going to write. For detail one, I want us to think about what Rosie looks like. So let's go back to our brainstorming. What detail did we write that talks about Rosie's looks? Cole? Okay, we said black. Was there something else that says how she looks? Manye? Small? What else? Furry. Furry. What am I going to use to separate them? Does somebody remember Paris? A comma. Black. Furry. Comma. Comma. Small. 
Yes, she is writing on a giant laminated SPO. Um, the reason that I was absolutely flawed with that lesson, because I got to be in Louisiana uh, filming it and observing it, is because there are just so many things that Miss Guillory is doing for those young students, right, in first grade. And you could remember, you could think about the trajectory for those students as they go to fourth grade, sixth grade, eighth grade, you know, high school, beyond, because already at such a young age, she is talking about topics. She's talking about audience. Think about writing about this for your parent. She is brainstorming and helping them categorize information and priming the pump for categorization and classification. She's teaching them how to take those ideas, aggregate them and organize them on an outline. The skills that were happening in that classroom, uh, it's, it's just it's just, it's tremendous. It's tremendous to see. And so what eventually will happen is as students become proficient with the SPO, it will not be a huge jump or leap to go to a multiple paragraph outline, which is where this goes, right? Once they get the paragraph right down, paragraph right first, then they can move to writing a composition and they will use a multiple paragraph outline to plan their essay or composition. Um, so last but not least, and we have a, you know about five minutes before Q&A opens, we did want to just show you, you know, proof is in the pudding. We wanted to show you some of the student progress. So what happens when students actually get exposed to these strategies? Um, so you saw Danny in September and you saw what Danny was, Danny's writing looked like. And then we fast forward to Danny in March, where Danny in that same school year was taught the single paragraph outline. He was taught the sentence level strategies. And you can see that, you know, that curtain was pulled back for Danny. And now you're seeing a positives appear in his topic sentence. Um, when he goes to take that outline and draft, you'll see you know, a positives in the topic sentence, you'll see subordinating conjunctions, which Danny was taught, um, transitions, um, you know, again, the note taking is starting to appear in his in his writing. So all of this did not happen by chance. This didn't happen, you know, overnight, but it just really happened because uh, Danny was explicitly taught these strategies. So he had these ideas, these strategies and these uh, the strategy and the method really helped him to take those ideas from his from here and get them down to pay on, on paper. And um, that's really what's so exciting. Here you see Michael, who was the student that we showed you earlier. Um, you know, did you like summer? I did. I'm going to tell you all about it. Speaking of amusement parks, you know, you can hear the stream of consciousness. You can almost see or visualize the student in front of you telling you about their, you know, Michael summer. But then you fast forward to Michael later on and you see that now, Michael, you know, same student, very different writing. You know, Ricky, a character in the banana leaf ball changes throughout the story. You have things like first, you know, in particular, starting with, you know, again, subordinating conjunctions. Um, so all of that sentence level work is starting to happen. And that outline work is also, you know, uh, the underpinning here of this student's transformation because that that paragraph is much more logical it's much more sequenced there's a clear sort of beginning middle and end uh, and all that sentence work now is starting to come to fruition uh, because of that explicit instruction and so um, the objectives of TWR are pretty clear and I hope that you sort of you know leave this um, presentation knowing what they are and first and foremost it really is to help improve the clarity of students written um, um, language or, or their writing. And also we're going to see students give much more uh, extended responses in their oral language in classrooms. So you're going to see their ability to really extend uh, and elaborate uh, also orally. Um, you're going to start to see enhanced complexity and coherence in student writing, right? Teaching them transitional words and phrases help really build fluid, fluidity in writing. Um, you're going to see improved reading comprehension because, you know, when students start to write those linguistically complex sentences themselves, the chances are they will process them better when they actually encounter them in written text. So you'll start to see that happening for students. Thinking, writing is thinking. So very much you're seeing students when they are writing, they really are um, elevating their thinking and they're thinking about the content they're learning. So it's really helping them with retention and cementing knowledge. Um, better study skills come from this, right? Students know how to outline, how to plan. And then last but not least, you will see uh, definitely not least, an increased sense of confidence in your students because you know, they actually know what to do and they have the skill set now to um, 
to do it. So um, I see that Jen is here and uh, right on cue, Jen. So that's our last slide. Um, and we thank you for giving us this time to present to all of you. And we'll definitely um, open up the floor for questions. Perfect timing. I couldn't have timed it better. <laughs> I was like, okay, do I need to tap in now? Um, thank you so much, doctors Room and Zaleo, for that excellent presentation about the Hockman method and um, the writing revolution. And I just love the idea that, you know, writing is all about the planning. I think too many teachers say, just go out and write, just write about this topic. And there's not that um, attention paid to um, how to outline and how to organize your ideas. And I think it's so important in order to alleviate that cognitive burden. Like we got to outline that stuff. So I really appreciate the time you spent really talking about planning and, and organizing and outlining. Um, so we had some great questions um, from everybody that registered. So I'm just going to um, start with a couple of them, if that's okay. Um, what is one strategy that you would recommend teachers incorporate into their instruction tomorrow? It's so hard to choose because it is. <laughs> what is one? Oof, there's there's if, so many. There's so many. I mean, if if we were to just zoom out for a moment from a very, <laughs> very specific TWR strategies, I could jump out and say sentence expansion. It's something that starts in kindergarten, it goes through high school. It's one that we didn't get to show tonight, but it has 5,000 benefits. But I would say on a, on a bigger level, the embedding of this explicit writing instruction into what it is that students are learning. So often what we see is that the writing is taught separately. It's sort of peeled away. And what happens is that in most cases is not going to transfer the student's independent writing. So when it comes to teaching that writing piece, finding opportunities where it's not taught is just a separate little mini lesson, totally unrelated to what it is that they're learning in class, but finding those opportunities. It happens in every daily lesson where we're asking a question, we're checking understanding. Often we're asking for them to do that in writing. That's an opportunity for them to, in a high leverage way, do two things at once, the writing and the learning at the same time. So on a, on a bigger macro level, I think we would say finding those opportunities to embed in content is, is critical. And I do love that because research does show us that these kids, especially the kids that need so much help, lack the background knowledge. And anytime we can bring two things together, like content and writing, it really improves everyone's outcome. It's yeah. not just teaching these isolated skills that don't really translate. So I love that. Um, are there some sample scope and sequences for each grade level available and all other resources, sources such as single paragraph outlines? Yes, yeah, so we have on our website, uh, which is just simply the writingrevolution.org, there is a uh, free resources section. You create a login, but it is free. It's known as the book resources section. And on there, you have access to some free materials, templates, including the SPO that teachers can print and customize. Uh, sample scope and sequences are also on there and some examples of the strategies in different content areas and grade levels. Perfect. Thank you. And we'll post that website um, on the IDA Georgia website. So you guys have a, a, a link. Um, so how does the writing instruction progress from those younger years, kindergarten through grade two, to the upper elementary years, three through five, and on into middle school and high school? Um, so I addressed that a little bit before in one of the earlier slides that really it's the content that will drive the rigor. So the strategies stay the strategies. The suite basically stays the suite. Um, what will basically happen though is, um, you know, over time, what's going to happen is as they're progressing through the grades, they will, it, the content that they're writing about, what they're reading, the materials, maybe the pace and one, the pace that they're going through some of the strategies, especially in schools that, Jen, it's really exciting when they've been doing it for several years, right? Because again, teachers, you know, are, are inheriting students that are already coming in with some, with some of these skills, so they can sort of um, not so much spend that time 
teaching the strategy, but using the strategy, reinforcing the strategy, and then that's, you know, starting from scratch all the time, you know, they'll do a quick review, and then they're ready to sort of jump and, and um, so, but it is, it is the content that drives the, the rigor and, um, and students just keep getting and over time, they keep getting uh, better and, and, and more efficient um, at those strategies and sort of maybe need less scaffolding and whatnot, but yeah, that was a great segue to the next question. Um, so what advice suggestions do you have for a middle or a high school teacher where grade level standards conflict with the idea of starting from the very foundational skills? It's a tough one. <laughs> I mean, we we've ex we experienced this ourselves being former high school teachers where uh, about 80% of the students, if not more, were coming into our school uh, below grade level. Uh, we had a large number of English language learners, and I see that question uh, just popped into the chat. So the reality, you have what the standards said the students should know and be able to do at that age level, and the reality of where those students were. Um, the other thing about the standards is they may have sort of said what the students should be able to do, but didn't really give a roadmap of how to get them there. And what we found was that if we met the students where they were, we could get them to meet those grade level standards. But rather than double down and say, well, by for in our situation in ninth grade, they should be writing a composition at the beginning of the year. That's the expectation. They weren't able to do that. And if we wanted to prepare them to do that, just having them write an essay every day was not going to get them there because of that cognitive piece among among other reasons. By the end of the school year, we were able to get them there, but it's because we, we started at that most basic level of the sentence with the outlines. So another thing that we want to clarify is that this is not like a checklist where it's first two sentences, then do paragraphs, but that that the the single paragraph outline, the paragraph piece can come in pretty quickly at the beginning of the school year alongside the sentence work. And when you were able to break that process down, like Dr. Zaleo said, once they could do that one paragraph, they could do two, they could do three. But if we let that anxiety of, and we all feel it as educators, this pressure of this is what they should be producing, it wasn't getting the outcomes. And when, when we started to see the outcomes, when we said, okay, let's stop for a minute and start at the most basic level and, and build up from there. No, that's great. I, I always love that analogy of like a building. Like if you don't start with a firm foundation, it's just going to crumble. You can like jump to stuff, but it's not going to translate. They won't carry it forward. It's just going to like all crumble down. So we do. I, I feel like that's just great advice. Um, starting like you can ramp it up faster, but you still got to get all the parts in there. So I think that's just such great advice. This is a very, um, this is a very go slow to go fast approach. Mm hmm. And that's really what's made the difference, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, so we talked about it just for a second, but how can the Hawkman method be used with um, ELL or, or bilingual students? And are any of the resources available in Spanish? It's a good, good that, question. Yeah, it is. We do, we do have some, but we've had teachers take a lot of the strategies and actually translate them, the outlines, the um, the sentence level work uh, in, in Spanish for sure. Uh, it, as, as Dr. Boone mentioned, we worked with, uh, we work with L's in all of our partner schools from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. We have some schools in New York City that are just predominantly um, for newcomers to the, to the United States. And uh, we've seen tremendous results there because it's a very, again, you're giving a very structured way to teach writing. It's very broken down. It's very truncated. The students will explain to you that they really, um, they get to play with syntax and language through strategies. Um, it gives them a really, um, it's just so clear and it's, it's providing that structure. And so um, the outline work, the sentence level work, it, it really has had huge benefits with students who are um, you know, uh, who are English language learners. Uh, and we've seen that, right, Dr. Um, Vroom? Yes, I mean, imagine that cognitive load, you know, for any of us to write, let alone if you're, you're having to perhaps translate something from a home language into English. And the outlines in particular, and what we didn't uh, have time to go into today is the note-taking aspect of that outline piece is so critical. I know uh, for my students, for the English language learners, they appreciated the ability to just get down very simply in just a couple key words, what the ideas were before having to then turn it into that paragraph or composition that they could stop for a moment and plot it out and then think about the best way that that could translate into a sentence instead of what typically is expected where that 
paragraph or that essay should just come from their minds. They have that ability to step back and plan it out first. And the note taking, again, is an important component of the Hoffman method that allows for that processing of the information first. And if I could just piggyback on that, something else that helps all students, but especially your English language learners or students, um, you know, in special education classroom settings, uh, basically it's also the, I, that this inherently differentiates this method and it's scaffolds so easily. So there's so many, again, um, you know, different scaffolds that can help students get there. You're not, again, just showing them a strategy and go. It's all these different scaffolded pieces that you can really help students um, to, to gain mastery and proficiency. So um, that's something that hooked us right away is that how quickly it, it differentiates and it, how you can meet a student where they're at to really help them to, to move. Right. And I love how you talked about the note taking piece. I think so often we don't pay, we just assume kids can just take notes. So when I give a student a, you know, a nonfiction passage, they just start highlighting everything. And you're like, well, it's not everything's important. And so it is important to, to really say, okay, what would you highlight? What would you take notes on? We don't need to write every word. Note taking is not about rewriting the article. It's about using strategies in order to like, so you can remember it to then transfer it and write a passage and outline it. So I love how you paid attention to that. Um, what are some of the best ways to engage reluctant writers or those that are afraid to write or those that struggle to get their thoughts down on paper? I think it's the, the whole method because what Dr. Hoffman has done in her brilliance is take something, a topic that is so hard and she'll say to us, yeah, teaching writing is rocket science. It's hard. It's the hardest, probably the hardest um, skill to teach and to learn. But uh, again, what is engagement? We always say engagement is just knowing what to do. So if your students know what to do and what she's basically done in this method is um, break down the steps of writing into really uh, very, it's very truncated, it's very manageable. Students can have mini victories along the way. So as a former high school teacher who watched students sort of collapse when they were asked to write because they probably were struggling writers throughout middle school and they just really didn't have a lot of success in writing. But now you're asking them to start at the sentence level and to sort of learn in a positive. Let's stay, let's focus on that for a little Little bit. Let's focus on using these conjunctions. And I would have students come up to me, Miss, Miss, did you see my positive? Look at my positive. You're building that confidence. They're sitting up a little taller because they now actually can, you know, assess, the, I mean, access um, those skills and they feel more confident. So we saw reluctant writers start to shift a little bit because you were not asking them out, you know, immediately out the gate. Let's write a five paragraph essay. Well, guess what? They haven't been successful for years writing the five paragraph essay. So what's gonna change now? Oh, wait, let me try to start at the sentence level and get those foundational skills. And regardless of grade level, let's go from there. Um, and then students start to say, hey, I, I can do this. And, you know, then the confidence begets confidence and they start to really enjoy writing. Yeah, I think, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Broom, go ahead. I was gonna say, and on the teacher end too. So it's so it's hard for the students, and on the teacher end too, having that ability to be able to give feedback to students or give them clear direction on how to get started uh, is just as important. And that's what the the language of the strategies will do. Is that the teachers have also have the opportunity to say, Are you struggling getting started? Remember when to write that topic sentence? You could use a subordinated conjunction. You could use a sentence like, and they know what that is because they've already practiced it. So it helps both student and student to student and student to, to teacher as well. And how important is that to give those constructive feedback, like not do better, but I need to see in a positive. I need to see more detail. I need to see this in your writing. It's just huge. And I love that you, you really brought that out. Mm -hmm. um, we have time for one more question. Um, and so just any recommend you have for um, writing videos or um, writing rubrics or informal assessments that you really like that teachers can use um, in order to evaluate, especially at the upper grade levels? So uh, we would definitely, again, direct educators to our website and specifically those free resources, because there you'll see some examples of assessments that we do with our students when we're 
have our lens really just looking at their writing. Uh, the Writing Revolution uh, book, which I, I have with me, uh, I don't know if you can see with the green screen, is a tremendous resource as well because you have chapters devoted just to assessment, uh, just to the, the examples of pacing guides in there. It explains how to roll it out. So both the, the book would serve as a tremendous resource uh, as well for that. Yeah. And the best advice I we would give is to um, you know get a get a writing sample sooner than later. Get something that all students can access. Give them something that they don't you know they have a lot of prior knowledge about. Like you saw some of our samples in the beginning of the year that we were giving students you know kind of topics that they could all again um, you know that content was prohibiting wasn't prohibiting them from writing. And then you get that sample and then try to you know collect a sample at the end of the year so you can start to make those comparisons after you you know taught the method or taught the strategies. And again, proof in the pudding. It's hard to refute when you start to compare a beginning uh, of year um, or pre-TWR sort of sample and post. It just sort of speaks for itself. Sorry about that. Fun at home. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm working in the basement. So I, I really can't thank you all enough. I mean, this was just a wonderful presentation. It gave me a lot of clarity and a lot of ways I can think about with my own students to organize thoughts um, and organize their passages and paragraphs better, which we all need. Um, and thank you for everyone for joining us this evening. I know we've all learned quite a bit more about using effective and evidence-based strategies from the Hawkman method for teaching writing, as well as reading as well as how to connect reading and writing. Um, if you have colleagues who missed tonight's webinar, please let them know that within 24 to 48 hours, all registrants will be receiving links to the webinar, as well as Dr. Broom and Zaleo's slides from their presentation. All registrants, including those on the wait list, will also have the opportunity to fill out a knowledge check or request for a certificate of attendance form after viewing the webinar, whether it's live or recorded. That form will be sent early next week and registrants will have the approximately one week to submit the form. Those who fill out the form will receive their certificate of attendance the day after the deadline for submission. Our next webinar on the Spotlight on Structured Literacy series will be on Wednesday, March 29th at 7 p.m. This speaker will be Dr. Elizabeth Stevens, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Learning Sciences at Georgia State University. Her presentation entitled Building Students' Word Knowledge, How to Teach Essential Words, will focus on the importance of building vocabulary instruction across the content areas and the role of word knowledge for students' reading comprehension. Please visit the IDA Georgia website to register for, Georgia, for Dr. Stevens' presentation and to access all the recordings for the webinars thus far. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening and good night. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.